We were young until we weren't, but the books stay the same. back to Meg because <laughs> we keep veering away from her and I think that we haven't fully uh, talked about why you uh, don't like the end for Meg so I'm gonna okay you've put forth already why you do like certain parts of the end for Meg in that like her final battle with it is to some degree about the conformity thing uh-huh. which I very much agree with there's so there's that arc for Meg and then I think Meg has a second arc that I also think the book does well Obviously, the whole situation with her dad and her, you know, having all of these issues and thinking really that her problems will be solved if her dad comes back. And she is by far the one most driven to get her dad. Like, Charles Wallace doesn't remember Mr. Murray. He has no memory of his father. It's been that long. And he was a baby. And even Charles Wallace can't remember from when he was a baby. Um, So when they go to him... And are able to, like, reach him in Karen's thoughts. Meg thinks that he's going to fix things. All of her emotional problems, everything that's gone wrong with Charles Wells, everything, like, Mr. Murray's going to fix it. And then, of course, like, he can't just fix it. And so after they test her away, she lashes out at him because of that. Because (laughs) he just left Charles Wallace behind. And, of course, like, she already to some degree feels left behind by him because he left them. There's all of that. And the part of the end is Meg, you know, having to realize that her father can't fix things and having to have that growing up moment that, again, I think we can all, we haven't all been on alien planets dealing with giant brains that have taken (laughs) over, but we can all understand having to realize your parents can't fix things. (laughs) And so... She has that very human moment. And then in that final confrontation with it, too, I think so much of of Meg throughout this book has been angry, has been worried, has been grieving. And that moment of her letting herself feel all that love she has for Charles Wallace and for her family and for everything is just like this moment of, of relief and also just kind of this moment of like, I don't know. For me, like, again, it doesn't fix things. It doesn't take away all of that ang- anger and that hurt and everything. But, like, the sometimes just, like, you get so into your anger and your grief and your unhappiness that, like, <laughs> you forget that you love things in this, like, really wonderful way that, like, you, you, we just go around loving things. Like, how cool is that? And so this moment of, like, relief at the end for Meg of, like, even in this, like, horrible situation she's still able to, in this, like, beautiful way humans can, just have this uncomplicated love for Charles Wallace. And I think it also, like, yeah, is her, after having to have Charles Wallace to some extent, like, take care of her, quote-unquote, throughout the book, it's her moment of being able to step up and be the big sister Charles Wallace needs in the end, and not be relying on her dad to come back and, and, you know, be the person to take care of Charles Wallace. So for me, I think Meg's arc works on like multiple levels. And I think that the moments in like the 50 to 75% part of the book where she really falters and the other characters have more agency, it makes it work in the end for me. But I want to hear more about like what didn't work for you. It really feels like Meg's character gets sidelined. Sometimes that's literally the case when she is paralyzed and is just taken off by these alien creatures and they sort of do this like healing process because we learn that meg has passed through the 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 world of kamisats is surrounded by this black thing and when they were entering it meg was protected by the glasses that were given to her But when she was coming out, she wasn't wearing those glasses. So she was, in essence, completely unprotected, completely unguarded from this black thing. And it has, like, entered her soul or whatever. So she gets taken off and is taken care of. And and it's frustrating for me because, like, the, the moments I loved about this book are when Meg is interacting with other characters. And it's literally a time where she's unable to interact with any characters 
But it's it's bigger than just that scene. It feels like that happens across the board for the last 100 pages or so because everything is just like, okay, we have to go here now. Okay, we have to go here now. Okay, we have to go here now. And Meg is literally just dragged along. And then there's this also this element that I found somewhat troubling. And maybe mm. I'm just overreacting. Like you said, Meg is very angry in this book. And one thing I really appreciated is that the book, for the most part, doesn't dismiss her feelings. It acknowledges that she has very good reasons to be angry. She has very good reasons to feel anxious and to feel hurt and to feel abandoned. Except near the end, when they test her off of Kamazots to this alien world where Meg is lashing out at her father for leaving Charles Wallace behind. And the narrative really goes out of its way to suggest this anger that Meg is expressing in this moment is not from herself. It's just that she's basically been infected by the black thing. And once you remove the infection, there's this, oh my God, there's this line. Let me see if I can find it. That aggravated me. So yeah, I feel like this is going to be a part where it's good for us to quote quite a bit. And I, there's a part from that scene that I, I want quoted. And maybe the line is in there. Do you want me to quote? And you can let me know if it's in here. Yeah, you can <laughs> go ahead. And if not, we can add it. Okay. I'll keep looking while you do your thing. Yeah, so this is when she's initially lashing out at Mr. Murray. It says, Disappointment was as dark and corrosive in her as the black thing. The ugly words tumbled from her cold lips, even though she herself could not believe that it was to her father, her beloved, longed-for father, that she was talking to in this way. If her tears had not still been frozen, they would have gushed from her eyes. She had found her father, and he had not made everything all right. Everything kept getting worse and worse. If the long search for her father was ended, and he wasn't able to overcome all their difficulties, there was nothing to guarantee they would all come out all right in the end. There was nothing left to hope for. She was frozen, and Charles Wallace was being devoured by it, and her omnipotent father was doing nothing. She teetered on the seesaw of love and hate, and the black thing pushed her down into hate. Um, and then it says, just a little a couple lines later, she did not realize she was as much in the power of the black thing as Charles Wallace. That was not the line, but that is part of it. So the actual line is, um, it's later on when they're trying to explain to these like aliens who the, the Mrs. W's are and like how they need to ask them for help. And Mr. Murray and Calvin are kind of hedging, not really sure what to do. And Meg lashes out and it says, she scowled down at the table saying, we've got to ask them for help now. You're just stupid if you think we don't. Aunt Beast spoke to the others. The child is distraught. Don't judge her harshly. She was almost taken by the black thing. Sometimes we can't know what spiritual damage it leaves, even when physical recovery is complete. I think part of this is that this quote-unquote black thing is so ill-defined in the book that we just <laughs> don't... We, we really have no idea what it is. But whenever somebody says that a girl's feelings are not her own and it's actually just because there's some impurity inside of her all the red alerts go off in my head i'm like oh no 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 like this is riding a very fine line and it just feels like so dismissive of something that's completely rational of her being distraught <laughs> that her brother's been left behind and distraught at the fact that her father doesn't seem to show any kind of urgency. And it's not in the sense of like, we need to rush, go rush back in, which actually the narrative addresses that like, no, we need to take time to figure out our plans. But you never feel from Mr. Murray any sense of like, we have to do something. That is a frustrating thing. So when Meg brings that up and is frustrated and lashes out, why is suddenly this feeling dismissed from her? And then there's like also another moment. She comments on how these alien creatures, when they first encounter each other, they say like, oh, we can help the girl. She just needs to relax and we'll take care of things, which is, as Meg rightly points out, the very same thing 
it has told them. They just need to relinquish their control and let them take care of things. And again, the narrative goes out of its way to spin this as Meg being wrong, to lash out at the aliens, lash out at her, at her dad for, for bringing up this point. And I think Le Engel realized this because the, the aliens have some kind of spiritual power where they're able to affect Meg's mood and apparently draw out the black thing from her. And I think Le Engel realized the contradiction here because, again, this kind of mood-altering ability is the exact same kind of thing that it is trying to do. And it's like, okay, well, why is it okay in this instance and not okay in this other instance on Kamazots? And the, the reasoning that Le Engel provides is that, well, what the aliens are doing feels good. It feels, feels nice. While what the what it was doing was painful, if it causes pain, it must be bad. And if it doesn't cause pain and actually relieves pain, it must be great. And I'm just like over here being like, oh, God, keep this woman away from Soma because like I get what she's trying to get at. But I don't think this is a good point or a good message to be making. It's also at odds with christianity and religion as a whole because it, th this is kind of a different issue but i <laughs> i hate this almost willful misunderstanding of christianity that christianity brings about peace and you know if i have to i'll just keep inserting the same jesus quote in here do not think i have come to bring peace on earth i've come not to bring peace but a sword. I have come to sow discord between a man and his father, between a daughter and her mother, a man's enemies will be members of his own family. And also just like the idea of Christianity, going back to Judaism, the idea is struggling with God. It's struggling with your religion. Religion inherently should be a painful thing because you're you're struggling to understand concepts that challenge really every single aspect of your life. That's not to say it can't bring peace, but anyway, it's not to get derailed on a tangent here. <laughs> yeah. So there's all these messages that seem at odds with what's being relayed at the beginning of the novel about Meg, about how she's constantly being put down, being dismissed being told that her feelings essentially are wrong and we as readers are to understand that's not a good thing and that's actually very harmful for her until we get to this scene to this moment where suddenly it's okay because well it, yeah it yeah, it's, uh, uh, you know the aliens are good guys so it's okay and it's like bullshit la angle explain yourself and that's where my biggest frustration with this whole ending is because if she had taken some time to um, define things a little bit, the evilness of the black thing is so ill-defined that you, you don't know what it is. And so when, we, when it says that like the black thing has infected Meg, what does that mean? Does that mean that it's always infected Meg? Was she infected back on Earth? Because we understand that the black thing is starting to encroach on the world. Are we supposed to then go back and question all that as well and be like, oh, actually, maybe all of her anger was derived from the black thing. Maybe none of these feelings were true to her. And I don't think the narrative is saying that. But it's a contradiction in this narrative, and it's very frustrating because I don't freaking know what to do with it. I okay. <laughs> I want to jump in. Yeah, please. I feel like, uh, you know, in school, people would skip rope and then, like, jump in. Yeah. That's what, that's what I feel like. Oh, uh, okay. I've been waiting for my time to, to jump in. <laughs> rope. Okay. So, lots lots of things you've brought up. Uh, I'll start off with the most recent one. No, I don't believe we're meant to understand she was being touched by this on Earth. I think it's meant to, we're meant to understand that, like, yeah, as she was tessering, it did impact her. But I also think, I agree that 
Blangle is does not do as well with this section in, in terms of articulating herself well. My understanding, and I, I'm going to reread this line, it says, uh, Meg teetered on the seesaw of love and hate, and the black thing pushed her down into hate. So my understanding is that she's already in this very complicated emotional space. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Obviously, she's just gone through like a shit ton. Charles Wallace's brain is being eaten, etc. <laughs> and as she's struggling with like her feelings of disappointment with her father and the fact that he hasn't <laughs> magically fixed everything, she's struggling between her love for him, but also her, her in this moment, hatred and disappointment. Like, in his actions, in his failure to act, and that her experiences and, like, having gone through this black thing and having to touch her basically pushes her in one direction versus the other. So, for me, like, it makes sense in terms of that, like, if, you know, we're struggling between our better selves and our worse selves, which is, in essence, what Meg is doing in this moment, it pushes her to be her worst self the way I think that trauma can. Mm -hmm. That's how I understand this, but I agree that like the narrative doesn't present it that way as clearly as it could. And certainly I think that Aunt Beast and the rest of her people are, yeah, not (laughs) as understanding of Meg and her position. And I've never known how much we're supposed to... Like, certainly Aunt Beast is good, right? Like, there's no question that they're doing good. But I'm never sure how much we're supposed to understand them as also flawed, the way that, like, Mr. Murray and Mrs. Murray are flawed, even if they are good. Because, yeah, there are moments where Aunt Beast is very helpful, but there's also moments where these creatures clearly just have no understanding of what's going on and how, are having a hard time sympathizing. I don't think that the narrative is ultimately dismissing Meg's feelings in this moment. I think it's just trying to show some nuance between Meg's feelings, but also how she's allowing negative outside influences to like make her negative feelings worse. We're meant to understand the difference between Meg's faults and Meg's flaws and like Meg lashing out at her father in a way that goes beyond that, right? Like be one thing for her to be expressing her disappointment Mm -hmm. (laughs) and it's another thing for her to just, she rips into him, you know? Was there anything else? And oh yeah, the religion thing. (laughs) Yeah, well, uh, before you get into that, because I do want to add a couple of points. Uh, I'm, you've pushed me out of the jump, jump ropes, and I'm jumping back in, and I'm pushing you out of the way. I think my biggest issue is it comes off as so patronizing, because the thing is, if you removed all those elements of the black thing apparently infecting Meg and, and just had her speaking out, the thing is, sometimes lashing out is very much warranted. And it really feels like what the narrative is saying, like, calm down, Meg, or, well, shut up, Meg, I guess. And that's very frustrating because sometimes it just feels like the Murrays in general are just so, like, stiff as human beings that they sometimes don't feel like human beings. And Meg's the only one who feels any emotion and is the only one with any willingness to show emotion. And up to this point, again, the book feels like the book is saying that's great. That's a great quality about her. It's the world casts it as a flaw, but it's actually one of her best strengths. And then here's the moment where it's not that. If you're going to really suggest that, like, she's being taken over by the black thing, we need it to be as drastic as we saw with Charles Wallace, where it is truly indeed a completely different person. And I I just did not get that sense. I think another frustrating bit about this is that if Meg hasn't been infected because she was unprotected from the black thing, why isn't Calvin impacted? He seems completely unharmed. And yeah, I get that he's like special, 
But we also established that Meg is special too. It may be not to the same degree, but it's just like, ah, uh, it seems like a missed opportunity. I, they do establish that like Meg is particularly bad at Tess, like at, at even just being Tesser. Yeah. That's kind of one of the things that's established throughout is that like all of the other characters Tesser better. And so what the book says is that Meg is affected by going through the black thing Partially because, one, Mr. Murray's bad at tessering compared to the Mrs. W's who were able to shield the kids. And two, Meg in particular was already, like, even with very expert tesserers, the least protected one and the most vulnerable during tessering. I, I, I would not object to, like, Meg being the only one touched by the black thing. But she also was the one that was the most on, like, about to give in to it when they left. So... I think she was in a precarious position. It just creates an unfortunate situation where you have a textual situation where all the men in the story, or at least boys in the story, are completely unaffected by tessering. It's only the girl that's impacted by this. I just think that's awkward for a book that is, in so many ways, obviously very feminist, obviously very... Like, Meg is a great nuanced female character that's wonderful to see. Uh, and, and you just have this awkward situation that it feels like it's falling into a lot of sexist traps of of depicting her as weak and emotional and out of control. You know, she just needs to be quiet. This thing needs to be removed from her. Then she'll be okay. I mean... Ugh. I see where you're coming from, but I also think it kind of removes it a little from the context of the rest of the story. Like, Charles Wallace, who again, boy, but also like, the brightest child ever, the most special boy, gives into it. Like, he gets taken over. So we already have someone that's been taken over by it. And then also, you know, we do have the Mrs. W's, who are certainly the kind of guiding lights of goodness in this book who are, are presented as female. But I also think that, like you mentioned that sometimes lashing out can be good. I disagree. I think that her expressing her anger and like her disappointment is okay. But I do think that there's like a fine line of like, there's a difference between communicating with other people how you're feeling and being honest and upfront about that and taking out your feelings on other people. And I think that one of the things that we as humans need to be good about with each other is trying to be, to not let the, the anger or unhappiness we feel that we are totally justified in feeling, trying not to take those feelings out on other people. And I think that Meg does very understandably <laughs> cross that line. It was like obviously a very fraught situation mm -hmm. instead of like trying to like actually talk with her father and Calvin. She reacts and she makes accusations and she's tries to hurt them in a way. Um, mm -hmm. That's, that's what we're under supposed to understand as as the influence of the black thing in her is not just that she is angry or upset, but in how she's using that anger and unhappiness to hurt the people she loves. First, first of all, so with Charles Wallace, I think that's a completely different situation because he basically faces head on it and tries to take on it, and and he succumbs to the black thing or it i guess through his own actions but in similar situations we have seen that like charles wallace is not impacted by tessering and certainly not impacted by simply the presence of the black thing as much as the other characters so i think that's a different kind of situation that we get with meg anyway uh in terms of lashing out I think there can be value in lashing out because sometimes in order to get somebody to listen to you, you have to yell. You have to hit at a sensitive spot. 
and get some kind of reaction because I do think we are, <laughs> especially in this scene, we're in a situation where it really feels like Meg's dad is not really doing anything about it. I mean, the scene where Meg's dad lets the aliens just carry Meg off is by itself horrifying. And the only narrative reason that's given to make it okay is that we're led to understand, well, these aliens are the good guys. But that doesn't justify it because at this point, we don't actually know that. The dad literally, after being reunited with his kid the first time in three, four years, it's like, yeah, just carry her off. I'm going to not come with you. I... Who the f*** is this guy? Like, you, if your kid is going to the hospital, you jump on the d ambulance, you f***ing idiot. And she's desperately trying to... <laughs> she's terrified. And his response is to just be like, oh, well, you know, they say they're going to take care of her, so that's fine. F I would raise my voice in that situation, too. Don't let these squid monsters carry me off. Like, what the... What are you doing? I'm just saying, Morgan, if you if we ever end up on a planet and I'm mortally injured and you're like, yeah, aliens, just carry them off. I don't care. I'm going to fucking hate you and I'm going to let you know that and you're going to have to deal with that. So it's uh... to be fair, the lashing out <laughs> happened before that. So, uh, well, anyway, it's just like there <laughs> there are so many elements in the in this this last quarter of the book that are just so frustrating for me that speak to bigger problems of how vague certain very important elements of this book are. Yeah. I mean, I think that I, to kind of go, well, connect this and also go back to your thing about religion and everything. Yes, yes, yes. I agree with you that the black thing is super undefined <laughs> in a way that's just not necessary. They could have just, like, It, I think, is a great villain. Mm -hmm. I think Kamazots and It are really strong. See, I think the difference between It and the Black Thing is that, like, yeah, the Black Thing is just kind of, like, generic evil, and that's it. That's really all you can say. Versus, like, I was taking notes about It, and, like, it's about the... Evils of conformity. Right. Evils of sort of giving in and submitting instead of resisting. There's like eugenics-y stuff. Like <laughs> anti-hive mind. So it allows for all these various interpretations in a way that are really is really interesting because it's defined enough to like let you grasp onto different ideas, but like not so defined that you're stuck in one mode of thought about it, right? So I think that that's what makes it much stronger than the black thing, which is just like evil. evil. Yeah. And similarly, I think that if I remember correctly, and God knows, I truly might not because it's been a hot second since I read the last of the books. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Many Waters is super Christian. So you kind of get a sense in this book, and I think that's carried on in the next book, that there are like fighters for the forces of good and like you said like the the mrs w's are kind of like one of the ways good fighting this is described is that they're like angelic and i think that that's where i think like you said the christianity in this book is like almost as badly defined as <laughs> the black thing uh -huh. if that makes sense yes it's kind of just like an open depository for like goodness and i think it would work and I think it does work, if I remember correctly, which, again, might be straight up wrong. So work better if, like, it wasn't tied to Christianity in this way. And there was just, like, like a bunch of Doctor Whos just traveling around the universe trying to do good. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's kind of how I think about the Mrs. Ws. They're just kind of uh -oh. tessering around trying to do good things and, like, you know, fight for the forces of good in the universe. Which I think works better when they're not weirdly being tied into Christianity and when that's not... So, like, uh, when they're at the Happy Medium's place, we kind of brushed over this in the summary. After they see that the Dark Thing has been attacking Earth and they find out it's been happening for a long time and that it's 
Earth is essentially a battlefield. Battlefield Earth, the worst film of the decade. And the Mrs. W's are like, you know some of the fighters uh. that have been fighting for good. Name them. And I know, yes, the groan. It's not great. At least there are some women named, but... Oof. I think there's just... It's just one woman, right? I might be misremembering. Uh, anyway. It's Marie Curry is the woman, I think. I think it's the... That's, she's the only one. I should double check. But yeah, uh, it's not great because like they start off with like Jesus. That, too, would have been stronger if, again, it didn't get like weirdly tied into religion. Not that Jesus wasn't a dude in his own right, regardless of Christianity, but... I've always thought that that little list thing, there's some people on there because like Meg gets into like some of the scientists and I'm like, go Meg. But it starts out with like Jesus and um, uh, there's Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Shakespeare, Bach, Einstein, uh, Gandhi and Buddha and Beethoven and Rembrandt and St. Francis. Very Eurocentric. This whole scene feels very much like somebody had to give a presentation in class and didn't prepare at all. And so they are just <laughs> rambling and they're like, oh, yeah, there's like famous artists like uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo and Donatello. Uh, and then um, there's also brown people, too. They exist. Who's the one token brown person we can use? Oh, Gandhi, of course. It's so bad. Yeah. It is so bad. It's pretty bad. It's frustrating because it's like very limiting too. Because it's just saying if you're famous, then apparently you're good, which doesn't feel like a very good <laughs> measurement. I don't really understand why it's here at all. I mean, <laughs> uh, I can say the obvious of what it's doing, but um, the idea that, like, yes, even on Earth we have people resisting even though Earth is, like, a shadowed planet or whatever. But certainly the examples chosen have not really aged well. Yeah. And then it's also, like, it's the inclusion of Gandhi in particular feels, <laughs> here's the one safe brown person that everybody knows about. Would she include Malcolm X in this list? Even even Jesus isn't a safe pick because then it's like, well, it's a big old f you to Jews. And it's like, well, what about Muhammad? I know. I was I've always been baffled about the fact that like the two religious figures chosen here are Jesus and Buddha. And I'm like, what about all the others? Yeah. <laughs> what about the other guys? And, she's and they're all guys. So I know. And it's like it's. She's trying to make a list that feels universal, but it's so superficially universal. It excludes a huge portion of people in the world. Because then you look at this as like, imagine you're a Muslim reader or a Jewish reader and you're like, so are my people contributing to the black thing then? Where, where do I fall in this battle with the quote unquote black thing? Yeah, I mean, it's hardly like they hardly are saying this is the list of all of the people who've ever fought. But like, it certainly, it feels to me like um how sometimes in like YA books or something, they'll mention like a specific CD they're listening to or TV show they're watching. And I'm like, you know, that's going to age really badly in 10 years. And that's how this feels to me is like, sometimes you should avoid specifics because uh -huh. <laughs> it's just not going to age well. And like, yeah, this is from what, 62. So uh -huh. it hasn't aged well at all. Like, <laughs> you know what it feels like? It feels like it was put in there specifically to encourage the kind of question in classrooms of like, who do you think kids would be <laughs> a, a hero for the light? Oh, God. And I think we did have that question. And you know what I bet would happen is that there would be some kid who says a, a, a figure, a historical figure that's somewhat controversial. And then you're going to have this awkward moment with the teacher being like, no, Morgan, you're a stupid child. You are wrong. The movie is clearly better. <laughs> it's bad. It's very bad. Yeah, I think that, I think that it weirdly, <laughs> this is going to be such a controversial statement. Uh, the Christianity works better in Chronicles of Narnia because it's more consistent. Oh, I don't disagree with versus, you. Versus like, it's so wishy-washy in this book <laughs> that like 
some people have even said this book is not Christian, <laughs> which is wrong. <laughs> well, let me just say, but like, you I can think understand the wishy-washiness. Why. Yeah. Yes. The wishy-washiness of it almost uh, makes it worse. So I think we can both agree that this book would be improved if, like, I think there could be some sense of spirituality, sure, like the whole, like, good versus evil thing can still be in there, but you don't need Christianity for that. Yeah. Or, you know, if you're going to use Christianity, just use, like, get at the themes rather than leaning on Christianity as a crutch. To go back to Tolkien and Lord of the Rings, like, there are a lot of Christian themes in uh, Lord of the Rings that I think are done extremely well. And it's because, I would argue, the reason why is because Tolkien doesn't rely on name dropping. He he actually took the time to really figure out, okay, how would this principle work in this situation? Let's apply it now. Where this book works... You didn't mention this in the summary, but uh, when when Meg is fighting the the initial time that Meg is fighting the brain, uh, she yeah. starts reciting the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, it's silly, but I do think it. There's actually a very interesting moment where yes. she says that all men are created equal, and the brain tries to argue that's exactly what i'm doing i'm making everyone equal by making everyone like each other and there's this mantra that they repeat that like wait sorry i have the quote right in front please of me. she's like we hold these truths be self love in it blah 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 you know what the declaration of independence is <laughs> then it says but that's exactly what we have on Kamazots. complete equality everybody exactly alike for a moment her brain reeled with confusion then came a moan of blazing truth no she cried triumphantly like and equal are not the same thing at all. Right. Sorry, I just wanted the dramatic quote of it. I all. appreciate you jumping in. Thank you. But I do think that that's a case where, I mean, it's obnoxious because it literally references the Declaration of Independence, <laughs> but it grapples with the themes that are being presented mm-hmm. in those lines. What does it mean to be equal? That's a moment that's more impactful than quoting a, uh, I was about to say stupid passage, but that's not right, <laughs> than quoting a passage from the Bible or saying that Jesus, Jesus, he's fighting the black thing. There's something to be said about subtlety and actually weaving your beliefs into the text in a way that's not just shouting at you, hey, kid. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. And if you don't follow him, oh boy, you're in for bad stuff. The black thing is going to get you. The black thing's going to yeah. seep into your soul and eat your brain. <laughs> and it's like, f*** you, Langle. Like, don't, that, don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Funnily enough, I think that uh, the fourth book in the series, which is called Many Waters, and it's Sandy and Denny's book, and it's about... Noah's Ark, essentially. (laughs) Like, literally, they get sent to, like, the desert really shortly before it's going to flood. It's a really fun book. Uh, But I actually think it weirdly does a better job of, like, grappling with some of the issues of Christianity, even while it's in an actual Christian story. Because I think you get more nuance to, like, there are all these people that are going to die. <laughs> like, you know? <laughs> but yeah, the, this is very, like, black and white in this is not interesting way versus, like, the it thing is, like, the much more interesting version of evil versus, like, Meg with her faults, you know, being the version of good we're getting. And that's a much just inherently more interesting and more dynamic story. And so, yeah, I wish that, you know, all the Uriel happy medium stuff had been compressed or altered so that we could focus on, you know, Camazots more and everything that happens there. Why don't we focus on Camazots then? Yeah. I mean, we. I was going to (laughs) say I wanted to shift gears to Camazots and Charles Wallace, if you don't mind. By all means, take it away. So, I, this is mostly my way of shifting gears to Charles Wallace, but I do think him and Camazots <laughs> is super interesting. So, like, woo! Oh, 
I suppose, what would you like to focus on first, Charles Wallace or Kamsatz? Because I can do both. Uh, uh, that's a good question. I don't. You just go and and Hardy. Yeah, I'll jump in when when you give me space in the ropes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I think I was really interested, especially with like um the context going in ha- us having just read of mice and men going in and looking at Charles Wallace as mm. like genius child, yeah, archetype who I. Um, I don't remember enough of the other books to really comment on whether they get more into, like, what exactly is going on with Charles Wallace, other than he continues to be just incredibly, incredibly smart. But, like, I was very interested this time in the setup of Charles Wallace as vaguely magical in the way that we've talked about, that he has this sort of, like, it's described as an uncanny way of knowing, in terms of his sense of like Meg and Mrs. Murray and to some degree other things. And that's part of what he brings in and tries to use in Camazots. And I do think it's interesting that he's not just smarts. Like he's obviously hugely intelligent, but there seems to be a degree of like empathy or understanding that happens with his like extra skill thing <laughs> that I thought was an interesting combination. Um, because you, we don't normally get that with, like, the hyper-intelligent child trope, right? Normally, that means they're somewhat removed from the emotion of it all. But, like, Charles Wallace is, to some degree, uber-empathetic. And that's part of what gets him into trouble in Camazots, is that he goes in and tries to understand uh, what's going on with the man with the red eyes and tries to... Uh, it seems like he's trying to essentially get into his head and walks into the trap fully and completely. And like I said, it, I think it's an interesting reversal of like the chosen one thing because Charles Wallace feels so much like the chosen one and the red-eyed man is like, only you can save me, Charles Wallace. <laughs> essentially, he's like, only you can do this. And that's what gets Charles Wallace in trouble is assuming that he's the only one who can do it and that hubris takes him over. But I... I did think there was something interesting about the fact that, like, like I mentioned previously, you can interpret it in a number of different ways, conformity being the obvious one, but also just, like, uh, you know what I didn't realize until I was Googling things is that apparently some people read it as, like, communism. Oh, yeah. Langle had to come out and be like, no, (laughs) it's more about, like, dictatorship or totalitarian regimes. I did think it was interesting on this read, the fact that, like, yeah, what gets Charles Wallace in trouble is not only hubris, but also an attempt to, like, understand it from the inside. And I was like, could you read it as, like, the metaphor of, like, I don't know, like, getting uh, sort of taken in by the cult? I don't know. I just thought it was, I hadn't really thought about, like, his empathetic empathetic powers and and how you could read that with Kamazots until this go round and then I got really fascinated by it yeah I don't I don't because there is this repeated theme of like a willingness to not understand and being okay with that and this seems like a moment of hubris for Charles Wallace like you said he's like I'm going to understand you and defeat you says the five-year-old boy. (laughs) (laughs) And it's like not understanding, like there are limits to your powers, right? And there are, Mm -hmm. there are limits to what you can withstand and acknowledging those limits is not a bad thing. I don't know. There's always, there's always like a, a subplot in fantasy worlds or any, any kind of like religious type story of how do you battle evil uh, without succumbing to evil It's a time-worn trope of, like, there's always that one character who's like, I'm going to study the enemy, and they inevitably become the enemy. And they're like, I can't possibly be seduced by the dark side. (laughs) And, you know, lo and behold, they can't. They can't do that. This is kind of Angle's take on that. Certainly the aspect of it in terms of conformity... I see where that's coming from, because especially Charles Wallace is the most strange child of all time. 
<laughs> and we do get a line, I think, from Mrs. What's It praising the mom for letting Charles be Charles. So it's it magnifies the horror that Charles B is being taken in through his own actions. Again, he's only five years old, so I don't know how how much you can really blame him for not understanding the the risks and consequences here. There's what is it with Christian children books and always ca- throwing the children into the most deadliest of situations? <laughs> anyway, the easy one to one analog of totalitarian government. It's like, yeah, OK, that's that's not good. We don't like that. But I honestly feel like a better example of that is also contained within this book of the school. Again, Christians hate school, apparently. <laughs> But there, there is a point that schools are designed in a way that, that the whole purpose is to create conformity, a more idealistic version of conformity, where everyone sort of starts off on equal footing, everyone receives the same education, where it rears its ugly head is when people don't fit the system. I think for Of Mice and Men, we talked about, you You mentioned how Charles Wallace could fit in this kind of spectrum of kids with cognitive disabilities and how that's treated. When I was reading this book, it's like, oh yeah, this sounds right. This reminds me exactly of how my brother was treated by the school system, of how they just try to push him into a round hole when he was a square peg or whatever. It mirrors my own experience like when i was a kid again i didn't really talk until i was seven my mom took me to get examined or evaluated or whatever at stanford to see what the was going on with me (laughs) and the person evaluating me said that i would need to be in special education which my mom very much disagreed with If I had been in special ed, my life would be completely different and I would be worse off. Not because that's just the fate of everyone who goes into that kind of system, but the system, the special education system is not designed to help people thrive. It's just there to babysit people. Instead, my mom was like, no, we're going to keep him in classes, in regular classes, and he's going to go to like some after school program and work on whatever he needs to work on. And lo and behold, here I am producing this podcast. Woo! Thanks, Mom. I love my mom. Uh-huh. My mom is cool. You you see systems that don't know how to deal with difference. So the reaction, rather than being like, okay, how do we conform to you to help you develop and reach your full potential? It's We're going to shove you into this round circle until you fit. And we don't care how much of you we have to break in the process. You're going to fit in here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so like, yeah, Kamazots is just the school that we see at the beginning of the book writ large. If you want to read it this way, I guess you could see it as like, This is what would happen to Charles Wallace if you stuck him into that school system. He would lose all of his difference. And that is terrible. I almost want to steer it away from talking about governmental systems because it's like that's so beyond childhood readers like we were. Mm -hmm. We don't know what communism is in fifth (laughs) and sixth grade. Like we do understand how we hate school. We do understand how we hate homework. Anyway, p- please go ahead. You, you're you going to say something. No, I was just going to say, I think that why it works is that regardless of what the original inspiration was, um, whether it was totalitarian regimes or not, it works on other levels. Um, and what is school if not a totalitarian regime? Indeed. Um, but... Yeah, no, I, I I really like what you said and, and how you took it. And I'm glad Charles Wallace worked for you because I do think he walks that fine line of, like, magical child. <laughs> and he oh, is five uh, years yeah. old, so. <laughs> if you want to read cognitive disability on him, like, he's terrible because he's a classic case of savant syndrome, and that's mm-hmm. problematic in and of itself. I didn't mm-hmm. really see it that way because the book doesn't, 
like the book goes out of its way to be like, no, no, no. This is just he's he's uh, he's touched by an angel or something else is going on <laughs> with his brain. Right. It's not so much that like I don't know how to put it this way. It's like his mind is just wired differently, which like I guess you can read in that way as well, but like not wired differently in traditional ways we think about, if that makes sense. <laughs> yes, yeah. This is a new form of wiring. <laughs> He's brand new. Him and Calvin. It seems to be a much more spiritual thing rather than scientific, I guess, or, or biological. I Yeah, it's, mm-hmm. you're right. It's hard to define. Oh, Charles Wallace. <laughs> I, I will say... I'm sorry, I keep spoiling future books, but I'm not sure we're going to cover them on the podcast or that mm. you'll ever read them. So yeah. I feel the need to just spill the beans. Why just spill your beans, Tommy? But the, the in terms of the school thing, uh, the next book has Charles Wallace like really going to school for the first time. And it is every bit as terrible as you would imagine it mm. is. One thing I do like that we've kind of touched on already that the book handles is the fact that like, the Murrays are okay with, like, Meg and Charles Wallace being different and allow them to do their own thing. And I was thinking about, like, once again, this is 1962. Uh-huh. How there was a certain point at which they, like, literally talked about it. Not just about, like, letting Charles Wallace be, but there was something else about, like, Meg and Charles Wallace and how they work differently. And I can't find it now. But, um... And I was, like, reading that, and I was like, wow, progressive for 1962. Like, very cool. And then, like, two seconds later, there was that thing about how, like, the Murrays did, like, IQ tests with all their children. (laughs) And I was like, wow, that's not progressive. (laughs) (laughs) Which I think is, like, an interesting way of looking at this book. I think, like, all of science fiction, when it gets right, sometimes it gets things, like, really right in terms of just, like, being progressive, having like thoughts that are still relevant today. And then there are things that you read it and you're like, wow. That one didn't age quite so well. Yeah. I This book made me really want to take IQ tests. And that's something I still suffer from. And I know they're bullshit. <laughs> but I want to take an IQ test. <laughs> Indeed. And it's also, we should know, bullshit <laughs> founded basically in eugenics itself. Yes. So it's, <laughs> IQ tests are very problematic. Yes. I do not endorse IQ tests. I will never actually take one because I'm not going to pay for that. <laughs> but I, there is a part of me that wants to take one just to see, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. And I partially blame this book for that. You! You did this to me! Well, who doesn't want to be a Charles Wallace? Actually, I don't want to be Charles Wallace. His no. life seems very dull. <laughs> to be honest, I'd rather be Meg. I like emotions. Emotions are fun. Emotions are fun. Plus, she marries Calvin, and I like Calvin. Uh, I I could live without <laughs> Calvin. That's okay. <laughs> uh, I'd also be down to marry Meg. Mm. I'd be happy to be Calvin and marry Meg. Except Calvin becomes like a diplomat or something, and I don't I don't want to be a diplomat. <laughs> Going back to the the question of romance, I do want a little little sexiness in my romance. So this is a little too uh, too tame for me. <laughs> That's right. You were touching booze when you were fourteen. So <laughs> <laughs> I think we may have run out of things to talk about. Uh, yeah. Is there anything else to talk about? The two dimensional planet was cool. <laughs> Oh, that's true. They do, in while they're test ring once, they go through a two-dimensional world where it's, it's you say cool, I say horrifying because literally yes. they can't like breathe. It's so claustrophobic. My actual note said, the two-dimensional planet always <laughs> f***ed me right up. <laughs> so there you go. Also, this book is full of great quotes, not like the actual quotes that Mrs. Who gives, but just like, there are a lot of really amazing lines in this book from, like, some of them we've already quoted, but, like, from the really fun l- ones, like, Mrs. What's It's, like, wild nights are my glory, which is great, mm. to just, like, iconic, meaningful ones, like, uh, there will no longer be so many pleasant things to look at if responsible people do not do something mm. about the unpleasant ones. There's just a lot of good, a lot of good quotes. My favorite quote, <laughs> it's when they're explaining how tessering works 
and they are going through the different dimensions. So there's the first dimension or whatever. And they say, well, it's a line. I think it's Meg who says this and it's all contained within quotation marks. And she says, well, a line. And then there's a colon and a bunch of dashes. And that's contained yeah. within a quotation mark. So I can only understand that somehow Meg verbalized a literal line in her dialogue, yeah. which I thought was very amusing. Yeah, I want to say in my like hard copy, which I don't have with me, they like fix that, but I can't be sure. <laughs> The version I have that's like the digital copy um, also has the the flat square come after and the third, which doesn't make sense because the third is the cube. Yeah. That whole part is like really messed up in this digital edition. And I don't know if that's just the digital edition or I can't remember if my hard copy is different. I think that just gets at the whole publishing history of this book because I know I read about it too. A big reason why so many publishers rejected it was because uh, they just had no f***ing clue what to make of it. They didn't know what <laughs> yeah. genre it fit. They didn't know if it was for children or adults or both or neither. And it like, and, and there's so many different references to like scientific ideas and uh, historical figures and all these things. And so, it, yeah, I'm sure this kind of book is liable to making mistakes yeah i think before we wrap up though we should say since we both read this as part of school and we had previously given our thoughts on whether some of the other books we read in school should be uh-huh. read in school i know you kind of already touched on this but like do, do we think this should be read in school ah uh, that's i'm oh <laughs> i'm so torn because Me too I'm sure your reasons might be similar, but I think part of my concerns with it is that it it, it leans so heavily on Christianity, yeah. on a Eurocentric perspective of the world that feels completely out of date now. It's frustrating because I do think there are elements in this book that are very valuable. And I think, again, La Engel does a fantastic job of never speaking down to her readers. If one were to teach this book, they would have to be very careful with certain elements of it, acknowledging that like, okay, they mentioned Jesus. You gotta, you gotta be willing to allow more nuance into this book than the book itself brings, I guess. Well, and it's hard to do that in like, you know, fifth, sixth grade classroom. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, my feelings are pretty much the same because I think there's so many things about this book that like I know I found important in a way that I'll say that like the other book we've read that I read in elementary school, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, like mm-hmm. I, I don't remember taking away so many like important <laughs> life things from. And so that one was very easy to be like, no, we don't need this in schools. Versus that, like, the portrayals of Meg and her struggles and all of the things that we've discussed and some of the other things. I mean, the whole, like, like and equal are not the same. What a, like, important thing to hear as a fifth grader, you know, Um, as a 10-year-old. So there's so many of those moments that I think are important and, like, I would want kids to be hearing. But... Like you said, it is very Christian, (laughs) very Christian. And I'm very much of the opinion that separation of church and state and all of that, like we should not be forcing any one religion on the masses. Schools should not be putting forth religious texts to their students. It might be, it would really, I think, depend on the curriculum surrounding it. Like what other books are they reading? You know, if this is like, if they're reading books that, you know, maybe the next book is something that has a main character who's a Muslim, or like, if they're making sure to have a diverse range of experiences presented, then I think it becomes less harmful. And then if you're, if you're showing a lot of different religions, Uh (laughs) then it becomes less like you're putting forward a religious viewpoint and more like you're just like, letting kids know about like important things in the world because yes religion's a big part of it for a lot of people 
But, you know, the context that I read this in was I think we only read other books that year that were like either, I know we read like some um, historical fiction about like uh, some guy during the Revolutionary War. Yeah, like all the other books were (laughs) white American centric, mostly male centric books. So in that context, I have to feel like... uh, the curriculum wasn't good and and we didn't need to have this christian perspective being kind of like shoved down our throats so yeah i agree my my feelings are complicated it's it's yes with a caveat with caveats unfortunately morgan it's because the black thing has infected you so (laughs) all of your complaints Uh, are not valid anymore i'm gonna just uh say that now whenever people are mad i'll be like the black thing's infected you (laughs) it's it'll be like the new is it your time of the month uh-huh. That'll be good. <laughs> Has the black thing infected you? <laughs> but it's great because it can apply to all genders. No one is safe Indeed. for the black thing, apparently. Yeah, the the black thing is feminist, really. <laughs> oh, I was, a, I was such a fool, of course. This is actually super progressive. <laughs>